Uh, hi. I'm Nina. Uh, I'm a researcher in cognitive neuroscience. And this is also me, an improviser. So what do scientific research and improvisational theater have in common? So as I try to address this question over the course of the talk, I'll also tell you a little bit about my own personal journey of how a cognitive neuroscientist found her way onto the improvisational theater stage. So for the last 13 years, I have worked in academic research, and I obtained a PhD in cognitive neuroscience and worked on experiments that address the relationship between brain and behavior. So what is a cognitive neuroscientist, you might ask? What it means is that I'm interested in how the brain gives rise to all the amazing mental processes that we tend to take for granted, like attention, memory, and language. And I first got into this work in college when I took a class on memory and the brain. And part of what I find really compelling about this line of work is that these cognitive processes, like memory and language, are so closely tied to our individual identities. So when I think of myself and my concept of who I am, that comes from memories and relationships with people and interactions with the world that I've experienced since birth. So what happens when those things go wrong? Right? It can be kind of scary to think about what happens when these mental processes like memory and language encounter some kind of dysfunction, like you might see in disorders such as amnesia and aphasia. So I'm drawn to this work because a lot of the ultimate goal of it is to be able to understand a complex system like the brain, how it gives rise to these mental processes like memory and language, to be able to eventually inform treatments for disorders of memory and language. And so over the course of those 13 years, um, I addressed a variety of questions, but I want to focus on one in particular that relates to how we as human beings process language. So we're experts at it, right? So every single day, every which way, language comes flying at you. You are getting text messages on your phone, you're listening to the radio, there are newspaper headlines flying at you, you are listening to speech, you're producing it, you might be writing emails, you might be reading emails, and despite this huge influx and outflux of information, seemingly automatically, you can process all of it instantly. And that's kind of surprising, because language is incredibly complex in its sound and structure and meaning. And every once in a while, that complexity comes through. And as we're trying to process all of this so automatically, we kind of just boggle for a moment. And so newspaper headlines are a great example of that. Princess Diana dressed to be auctioned. OK, wait a second, right? Who's on the auction block? Is it Princess Diana or her dresses? Sound transit train hits teenage girl, survives. Man shot, killed in Miami for third consecutive night. <laughs> Passengers hit by canceled trains. And this one's my favorite. Students cook and serve grandparents. <laughs> Right? And it becomes apparent after a moment, we're not talking about passengers being physically impacted by trains or cannibalistic students eating their relatives. Right? Uh, you just have to kind of readjust your initial expectations to figure out what the sentence actually means. And so how does the brain allow us to do this? So to try to answer that question, I borrowed a page from the psychological literature and gave people uh, something called the Stroop test. And if you're not familiar with the Stroop test, you're about to be, because I'm going to ask you to do it. So in a moment, you're going to see uh, words pop up on the computer screen. And as each one does, I want you to shout out loud, as fast as you can, what font color the word has been printed in. Ready? All right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do boggling in the strip test and boggling when you read these newspaper headlines possibly have in common? Well, it turns out that both activate the same part of the brain. So using non-invasive brain imaging, uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, 
I looked at what happened when people did the street test that you just did, or read sentences that had ambiguities like the newspaper headlines that you just read. And it turns out that in both cases, this purple region here, a region called the left inferior frontal gyrus, was active. It showed a link between brain activity as we're processing this boggle in the Stroop test and in the language test. And although that's shared between these two things, there are a lot of other things about doing the Stroop test and the language test that are very different. There's processing one word versus many words. There's differences in the visual characteristics and context, all sorts of differences. And so there, what we found was that the purple region talked to different parts of the brain depending on what the task was. So it communicated with one set of regions when it was doing the Stroop test and with a different set of regions when it was doing the language test. And so what this told me, what I discovered, was that these seemingly different cognitive processes actually shared brain architecture and communicated throughout the brain in distinct ways that were tailored depending on what cognitive process was happening in real time. So this is pretty cool, and I'd love to tell you that this discovery was simple and straightforward and linear, but as you've already heard tonight, scientific research is anything but that. Here's how you might expect science to go. You make an observation about the world, and that leads you to test a question, pose a question about what you think might be true. You then have a hypothesis that makes some prediction about maybe two variables that you think are going to be interesting and related to that observation. You collect data to test that hypothesis, analyze the results, and in an ideal world, draw a conclusion that links back to the initial hypothesis that you set out with. But scientific research requires a lot of patience. It's full of failure. And importantly, you want to be open to opportunities for discovery and surprise. Because scientific research is incredibly nonlinear, and it's just not that simple. Along the way, there's all sorts of noise you have to figure out. You might have to entertain different alternative hypotheses in addition to the one that you're testing. You could be encountering confounding variables during data collection that interfere with the two variables that you really care about. And I won't even get started on the peer review process of getting your paper published. But despite the fact that scientific research is difficult and full of failures, it's also incredibly rewarding. Because when you actually make that discovery between two variables and show that meaningful relationship, you've discovered something that nobody else has discovered before. You have created knowledge. You have found this meaningful, novel relationship between two things of interest and done it in a way that nobody has done before, or taken an approach that nobody has taken before. So that makes you an expert in the topic, which is pretty amazing. So being open to opportunities for discovery, I'll argue, is something that benefits you tremendously in scientific research. But I think it's also true in life. So I'm going to give you another example of that with me. So for a long time, I thought I had a plan in life. It was going to be high school, heading down south for college at Duke University, back up north for grad school in Philadelphia, on to a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Maryland, and along the way, I never took any breaks. I was always planning the next step when I was in the current one, because all of it was meant to culminate with obtaining a tenure-track job at an academic institution. That was the plan. But then in 2013, there were budget cuts, and the money ran out. And suddenly, I didn't know what came next, because I was told that the government contract that was funding my postdoc was going to run out in six months, and I was responsible for finding my next position. And I had no idea what came next. And I knew that I didn't like that feeling of uncertainty. I really didn't like it. So as it turns out, as things tend to, things were fine. I obtained a fellowship to work at the National Institutes of Health. That's where I am now as a health science policy analyst uh, I support scientific research at the National Institute for Neurological Disorders and Stroke. And along the way, something else pretty amazing happened too, which is that I wound up attending an improv show at the Washington Improv Theater. That's the plan that didn't happen, and that's what, what I found improv. Um, so what is improv? Um, so improvisational theater, you might think of the show Whose Line Is It Anyway? Um, or you might think of people like Amy Poehler, Steve Carell, Tina Fey, who are all Hollywood celebrities who got their starts in improv. So 
So improvisational theater, or improv for short, is a form of live theater in which the plot, characters, and dialogue are all made up on the spot in the moment. Nothing has been scripted or planned in advance. Oftentimes, the performers will get a suggestion from the audience to get the show started, or they might draw on some source of inspiration, um, like a, a line from a poem, or a movie quote, or a story from the audience. I'm going to show you a quick example. two people walked out and one of them grabbed a stool. And suddenly we've gotten to, will we're right to get down here this instant? I won't show you the rest of the scene, but what happens is it goes on to show the family dynamics of the Wright brothers, Orville and Wilbur, because the stool just became a plane, and they're navigating the development of airplane technology in a neighborhood that looks down upon it and wants horses forever. So, so how does this get, how do we get there, right? This art form literally embraces not knowing what comes next or at all. So here's how you think improv might happen, right? There's an idea, everybody comes together and does the idea, and the outcome's gonna be laughter. But that's not how it works, right? As you may know, the mantra for improv is yes and. And what that means is that you immediately agree to an idea and you support it no matter what. So if you offer the idea, there's confidence that you'll be supported. If your partner offers the idea, then you agree to it immediately and support it no matter what. That's the yes. And then the two of you, collaboratively, one step at a time, will build whatever comes next. You build it together. That's the and. And you follow wherever that path is going to take you, no matter what. So I said yes to my first improv class. And honestly, the rest is history. Um, I'm not going to lie to you, the first time that I took the stage in front of real, actual, live, in the flesh human beings uh, was probably one of the most terrifying experiences of my life because, as I told you, I was physiologically averse to uncertainty. But since then, because I said yes to that opportunity and allowed for discovery, it opened up this whole world of possibilities. And so what I discovered there is that improv doesn't just have to be funny. Right? You can have a dramatic improvised murder mystery show where you create this world of tightly woven characters, but there's a murderer amongst them, and it's up to them to figure it out, and the audience tries to guess their identity at the end of the show. Or you travel to New York with your friends, your improv team. You perform in a 72-hour improv festival called the Del Close Marathon that celebrates the art form of improv. Or you take the stage with the sisterhood of strong women to tell hilarious and heartbreaking and heartfelt improvised monologue stories about what it means to be a woman and the feminine experience and relationships with other women as well as with herself. Or you win a March Madness-like improv tournament where your team creates on-the-fly couples on a double date and explores all the di dysfunctional dynamics therein. None of these would have happened if I didn't say yes to the first opportunity for an improv class. So coming back to my original question, so what do scientific research and improvisational theater have in common? Well, in research, you're working to extract signal from noise in your data, right? To identify something that is meaningful and novel, to literally discover something that's previously unknown. In improv, what you're trying to do is to create meaningful relationships with the characters on stage. 
And this happens when you don't have an end game or outcome in mind, but instead allow yourself to be surprised by what you might find along the way. So in answering this question, what do the research and the improv have in common? Well, they both embrace discovery. And it's not just about embracing discovery, it really is a foundational keystone for the success in both of these fields, in scientific research, in improvisational theater, and I would argue to you, also in life. Thank you very much, and happy to be here.